investigation, the position is the patient lying supine at 45 degrees, which is the cardiac position or severe combat position, however you want to refer to it, with the palms facing up. Can you please? Thank you. The examination begins with the examination of the pulse. The pulse that we use is the radial pulse. And when we examine the pulse, we're checking for five things. Rate, rhythm, volume, character, and synchronicity. The normal heart rate is between 60 and 100 beats per minute. For rhythm, the normal heart rhythm is regular, but sometimes you can feel an irregular rhythm. And when you feel that, you need to familiarize yourself with the type of irregular rhythm that you are feeling. So for example, if you feel an irregularly irregular rhythm, that's usually keeping in line with atrial fibrillation. And if you feel a regularly irregular rhythm, that's usually keeping in line with sinus tachycardia. Sinus tachycardia is physiological. It's usually when the heart rate increases with inspiration and decreases with expiration. And the reason is because during inspiration, our blood pressure naturally falls down a bit. That triggers our very receptor reflex and increases the heart rate. While during expiration, our blood pressure rises a bit and that depresses the barrel receptor reflex and our heart rate falls down a bit. I'll explain the mechanism more in detail later. So after checking the weight, the rhythm, next is the volume. So you need to feel, is the pulse of adequate volume? Is it, does it feel weak or threading, which is keeping in line with hypovolemia or even in shock? After the volume, you need to determine the character of the pulse. So there are some characters that you need to familiarize yourself with, like the collapsing pulse, pulses alterance, and pulses paradoxes. The collapsing pulse is usually seen with aortic regurgitation. And how you examine that is you ask the patient, sir, do you have any pain in this shoulder? No. If the patient doesn't have any shoulder pain, you feel for the pulse, the radial pulse, you pick up the patient's wrist, and you raise the hand above the patient's head. If you feel the pulse disappear or collapse, then that's called a collapsing pulse. And like we said, it's usually seen in aortic regurgitation. Next is pulses alterance. This is just an alternating weak pulse, alternating with a strong pulse. So if one pulse is weak, the next one is strong. Then it's weak, then it's strong. And that's seen in left ventricular failure. Last is pulses paradoxes. And this is when you're feeling the pulse and the patient inspires and the pulse gets weaker or even disappears. It's usually seen in severe asthma, constrictive pericarditis, or cardiac tamponade. When you take a deep breath in and you inspire, you expand your intrathoracic volume. This makes the intrathoracic pressure more negative. Making the intrathoracic pressure more negative draws blood in from both the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava. So that means you increase your venous return to the right side of the heart, at the same time expanding the veins in the lungs. So we expand our pulmonary vasculature. This does two things. It pulls blood in the lungs. That means less blood goes back to the left side of the heart. And because of that, our cardiac output falls. That's why during inspiration, we, our blood pressure is lower because most of the blood returning to the heart is pulled in the lungs. While in expiration, because we decrease our intrathoracic volume, we increase that intrathoracic pressure, and that pushes all of that blood trapped in the lungs, returning it back to the left side of the heart and increasing our blood pressure during expiration. So, so that's why our blood pressure falls during inspiration, uh, triggering a reflex tachycardia, and our blood pressure rises during expiration, triggering a reflex bradycardia. So during constrictive pericarditis, severe asthma, and cardiac tamponade, this drop in blood pressure is severely exaggerated, making it drop more than 10 millimeters of mercury. So that's why when we feel the pulse during inspiration, the pulse gets weaker because the blood pressure dramatically drops. So after assessing the rate, the rhythm, the volume, the character, the last thing to assess when you're examining the pulse is for synchronicity. We check for two places, radio radial delay and radio femoral delay. So the first is radio radial delay. We just palpate both radial pulses at the same time. There will be radio radial delay in cases like coarctation of the aorta, subclavian artery stenosis, or even dissection of the aorta. Second is radio femoral delay. So we palpate for the femoral pulse, which will also be delayed in coarctation of the aorta. After finishing with the pulse, we move on to inspect the medial aspect of the arm for locomotor brachialis. Locomotor brachialis is a thickened, dilated, and torturous brachial artery, usually seen in the elderly, and is associated with severe hypertension and atherosclerosis. So we look in the medial aspect of the elbow and we feel. Thank you. 
After that, the last thing to do in the arms is to measure the blood pressure. We will do that in a separate video, so we'll be skipping this. After finishing with the arm, we move on to the neck. And we do two things in the neck. We palpate for the carotid pulses and inspect for the JVP. So to palpate for the carotid pulse, we simply palpate medial to the external by the muscle. And for palpation of the carotid pulse, there are two rules that you need to know. Number one is to never palpate both at the same time because they are the major blood supply to the head. Palpating and both at the same time can cut off blood supply to the patient's head and cause fainting. The second thing you need to know when palpating for the carotid pulse is you need to palpate with gentle pressure because putting too much pressure can overstimulate the viral receptor reflex and cause reflex bradycardia and fainting as well. The carotid pulse tells us about the function of the left ventricle and the aorta. How do we assess for the right ventricle and the right atrium? Well, that's through the JVP. So to examine the JVP, we simply tell the patient to slightly look towards the left and then rest their head on a pillow. This is to relax the sternocleidomastoid. And to look for the JVP, we look in between the two heads of the sternocleidomastoid. So the sternal head and the clavicular head. And we look somewhere around here to see if we can see any visible pulsation. Lastly, we move to the precordium. An examination of the precordium includes inspection, palpation, and auscultation. We will not be percussing the precordium. So, examination of the precordium begins with inspection. And in case you're wondering what the precordium is, it's the area of the anterior chest covering the area of the heart. So, we inspect. And what we're looking for is any sternotomy scars, pacemaker scars, chest wall abnormalities, and precordial activity. So, the precordium will be more active or hyperactive. After inspection, then we palpate, and palpation begins with palpating for the apex beat. The apex beat is the most inferior lateral point at which the cardiac impulse can be felt. How we do that is using the flat of our fingers, we begin in the axilla, moving medially until we feel the apex beat. If you feel the apex beat, you need to localize it with one finger, and then locate it. The normal location of the apex beat is in the fifth intercostal space mid clavicular line. So we need to look, localize this apex beat. So how we do that is we feel from the sternal notch, the manubrium until we locate the angle of Louis. Moving laterally from the angle of Louis, you can feel that the second rib is attached to it. So that means the intercostal space below that is the second intercostal space. And we move third intercostal space, fourth intercostal space, fifth intercostal space, mid-clavicular line, and that's our apex beat. If you don't feel the apex beat, you can ask the patient to slightly move to the left. Can you see? Please do that and feel. Okay, come on back. If you still don't feel the apex beat after that, that's okay. Don't panic because the apex beat is actually only palpable in about 15% of adults. So after feeling for the apex beat, the next is to feel for any heat. A heave is a palpable beat that noticeably lifts your fingers. And that can be seen in ventricular hypertrophy. So to feel for left ventricular hypertrophy, we use the heel of our hand over the mitral area. And if we can feel it lifting our hand, then we can see that that's positive for left ventricular hypertrophy. To examine for right ventricular hypertrophy, we use the heel over the left parasternal area. If we feel it lifting our finger, we can see that there is right ventricular hypertrophy. After that, the last step in palpation is to feel for thrills. A thrill is just a palpable moment, which is equal to a grade 4 momo. You don't need to know the grades of momo, but it helps when you know that grade 4 momo is when you start feeling a thrill. So to feel a thrill, you just use the flat of your fingers over the four valvular areas. The last step in cardiovascular examination is the auscultation. So to begin our auscultation, we need to first of all wear our stethoscope the right way. This is very important. We need to wear the stethoscope like this with the ears facing forward because that's the direction of the ear canal. And then we feel using the diaphragm. And we do the same thing over the full valvular area. So you can begin at the mitral to the aortic or from the aortic to the mitral. For, this, for the purpose of this exam, we'll behave from the AOT down to the right. We feel for the angle of Louis, locate the intercostal space on the right side of the body for the aortic valvular area. We move to the left, second intercostal space for the pulmonary, left, fourth intercostal space for the tricuspid, 
and fifth interpascal space midclavicular line for the mitral. For the purpose of the exam, your patients will most likely have healthy hearts with no cardiovascular diseases. But in the case whereby you pick up a murmur, there are some certain maneuvers that you might want to perform on the patient. For example, if you feel a mitral stenosis murmur, the maneuver is to use your bell because mitral stenosis is a low pitch sound and we use the bell to listen for low pitch sound. So you switch for the bell, you listen over the mitral area and you ask the patient to slightly lean towards that side. Thank you. For mitral regurgitation, you switch back to your diaphragm and you look and you auscultate over the mitral area and extend your auscultation down to the axilla because mitral regurgitation classically radiates to the axilla. For aortic regurgitation, you listen in the left or external area with your diaphragm and ask the patient to sit up. Sorry, sir, can you sit up? And then lean forward. Thank you. And then lastly, for aortic stenosis, we switch back to our bell because it's also a low pitch sound and we listen over the carotid because aortic stenosis classically radiates to the carotid. So while doing these maneuvers, you can decide to ask your patient to breathe in and hold or breathe out and hold. This is because classically right-sided murmurs are louder during inspiration and left-sided murmurs are louder during expiration. The reason is similar to what we explained before. During inspiration, there's more venous return because we make our intrathoracic cavity more negative. That means more blood goes to the right side of the heart, but less blood leaves the heart because most of that blood is pulled in the lungs. But during expiration, as our chest wall comes back in and the intrathoracic pressure increases, the blood that was pulled in the lungs is pushed out and hence more blood goes back to the left side of the heart and our cardiac output increases. So that's why right-sided murmurs like tricuspid and pulmonary valvular abnormalities are louder during inspiration and left-sided murmurs like mitral and aortic valvular abnormalities are louder during expiration. So to conclude cardiovascular examination, we ask the patient to kindly sit up. Sir, can you please sit up? Thank you. So the final step of the cardiovascular examination includes four things. The first is auscultating over the base of the lungs to check if there's any evidence of pulmonary edema. The second step is to check for any sacral edema, which is a pitting edema. So we press and we look and we rub. The third step is to feel for any hepatomegaly. But like we said, be careful because patients with heart failure tend to have a tender hepatomegaly. And lastly, is to check for any pedal edema, which is a form of pitting edema. So this brings us to the end of our cardiovascular examination. Thank you very much, sir.